Uh, the idea on this was initially the, the course was going to be called, uh, what was it, Basic Takeoff Estimating Tools and Plan Reading. And I was told that it's essentially that, very, very basics. Okay, so, uh, okay. It was a lot harder than I thought this was going to be to go back to the basics. So, I had to use my own experience, my life experiences, to kind of develop this. And I really hope it's going to help you. If it doesn't, I really apologize, but I'm going to do my best, okay? <laughs> but I actually thought about this, and I thought, you know, this is really the better order. We're going to talk about plans, because that's the first thing that you have to look at. We're going to look at some of the estimating tools, manual and digital takeoff tools, and what a basic takeoff actually is. Let's see if this thing's going to work for me. Awesome. Let's go over All right. So a little bit about me. If, uh, I've met some of you before. Uh, I came from SmartBid. Many of you subcontractors have received invitations from SmartBid over the years. I actually was one of the very first people to come aboard. We had one general contractor. I was an estimator. Long story. Hooked up with them to help develop that, um, that product. And I was with them for about 10 years until we got acquired by Construct Connect, which is iSquare Foot, which was our main competitor. So it's been a really fun year. Um, but I got a lot of things to offer to talk to you about with that as well. So, <coughs> I started out, um, just a real brief history, try not to bore you, but I think it's relevant to this. I started out, I uh, pulled up to a job site one day at 18, right out of high school, and uh, it was a plaster. Uh, he had the old pump and um, separate uh, plaster machine. I needed a job. And he said, sure, can you shovel sand? Sure. Mm -hmm. Five bucks an hour, I was shoveling sand for about two years. I was in pretty good shape. Then I became a hot carrier. Now the cool thing about being a hot carrier, the sound was a little boring, kind of. The really cool thing about it was always thinking ahead. I learned from some really old guys, well I thought they were older or younger than I am now, <coughs> how to work smarter and not work harder. How to always think ahead. As a hot carrier, I had to have a scaffold set ahead for those guys, and if they didn't, I don't know if you know any plasterers, they're a tough crowd. They definitely are a tough crowd. If I didn't have everything set and ready for them, they were screaming at me. So I always had to think ahead. And to think ahead and be smarter, I would like figure out better ways to carry scaffold, not throw planks on the ground so I didn't have to pick them up 20 times a day, maybe only 10 times a day. <coughs> so then, um, after I was all burned out and getting cortisone shots from all that hard work, um, I actually got a, an opportunity to become a superintendent for a commercial construction company. <coughs> and I found that my field experience really helped a lot. We're going to talk about that. And then I moved on to estimating project manager and so on. I actually, um, after many years, I started doing outsourced estimating and takeoffs. I was using an OST at the time. And I essentially would do work for anybody that would pay me. Architects, developers, subs, suppliers, whatever, doing different things. <coughs> and now I don't know if anybody's seen the mid coach videos, the smart bit, I do these little one minute blurbs. Um, they're actually kind of funny, kind of fun. Just little, little tips on mid coach, and that's all it is. So I've come a long way, um, but I still am true to my roots. I actually, and I don't have to, I still have a landscape contractor in Hawaii. I still do takeoffs for a couple times a year because I love it so much. And it's not part of my job to connect or anything like that, but I really, really enjoy it. So that's just a little bit about me, which I'm hoping qualifies me enough in your mind to be able to talk to you guys. Okay. I've been to many of these things too on the opposite end. And somebody gets up here and they just read and they they say this and here's how you do that, and here's how you do that. I can't sit through those very well, so I'm going to try just my approach on that. So a little bit about me. Alright. Um, as a superintendent, I thought that the PNs and estimators were always out of their minds. This is too far often I was in the field working for a sub or not. I was a superintendent. The sub would come to me and say, well, I don't have that in my scope. And everybody's heard that. If you've been in this a little while, you've heard that. So if you're a sub, somebody comes back to you and says, well, yeah, you do. And then ensues the argument and what, whatever happens after that. <coughs> However, as a commercial GC superintendent, I kept a lot of t-shirts in the <coughs> And t-shirts kind of help with a lot of change orders. The point is, that I'm trying to make with this, is it all started from some estimator somewhere, whether it was on the GC side or whether it was on the sub side. 
there was a misconception of what the scope, the actual work of scope was supposed to be. We're going to dive really deep, I think, in the scope of work that you guys need to know about. <coughs> so thus would begin the rest of it. As a superintendent, I would have to go check the contract, I'd have to go call the office, I'd have to go through the plans with them, we'd have to go through all sorts of stuff. And so some other way, the work had to get done regardless. And many of us have been in that position, whether we came to an agreement, we made a deal, whatever the case is, the work had to get done. <coughs> so, what is actual estimating? Because the estimator in this the scenario that I just gave you, somebody went awry. So the estimation is a cost. And it's, uh, it's a bit different than a quote or an actual proposal. So if you go to, a, um, I don't know, you go to, you buy a house, there's a list price for that house and you know what it's going to cost you. It's not really that way with construction, right? Um, in fact, on the GC side, if I get a proposal, same exact set of plans, same set of specs, I get three different proposals, three different inclusions, three different exclusions, and so on and so on. So the estimated part of this is really using all the information given to you, the estimator, which includes the specs, the drawings, any correspondence that comes back between you and your manager, or the project manager, or the GC, or wherever that information is coming from. It does not necessarily mean it has to be documented, right? Anybody heard of architect's intent? Okay, well, architect's intent means it doesn't really have to be specifically down to the nuts and bolts on a specific item. It was the intent that that wall is built in. So be very careful. Understand the specs, plans, all documentation is very, very important. And I learned that the hard way because I thought I knew everything and I knew better than I didn't have to read. Okay? I know a lot of you guys have been in here for, for in estimating for over five years, so we're really short of that. You already know that, but I want to make sure that those starting out understand that. The specs, the architectural drawings, the structural drawings, for example, sometimes are different. <clears throat> Something has to happen, right? To be able for you to encompass the actual scope of work. So we'll talk about that a little bit too. So, Essentially, you have to use several different things to come to this estimate that you're going to provide to somebody for the scope of work. It's going to take your knowledge, whatever your knowledge is at that point, your skills, hunches. How many agree with that? How many have used a hunch on proposals and estimates? You can raise your hands. It's okay. All right. Yeah, I see a lot of hands shaking. Good. Because I do too. And everybody does. If they say they don't, I disagree. And tools. <coughs> I'm in my mid-50s. I know I'm hard to manage. Okay. And I still am open to always learning with new tools. Never close your mind that the tool you're using is the only tool and the best tool. Okay? Um, how many have worked in the field, actually worked in the field in construction in any sort? A lot of you, you had tools that you used for, for whatever you had to do, right? And there's always some way that you can find a better tool to do what you're doing. Never close your mind to the, to the thought that there could be a better tool for what you're doing, especially the way the industry is today. Um, I was working for JB Knowledge. Anybody here heard of James Benham or seen him speak? No. He's one of the best construction technology, construction speakers in the nation right now. That's who I worked for for about 10 years this morning. Construction has always been the slowest, absolute slowest, when it comes to adopting technology. Uh, we're for some of the bigger companies, and we know who they are, um, they, they have the budget to try a lot of those things, and they've helped the industry vet out a lot of that. What we're actually seeing right now is a wave of technology in construction. So to become a brand new estimator right now is super, super exciting because you're not stuck in a mold that you have to do it a specific way. There's a lot of technology that's coming up. And all those technologies, and we're going to talk about this in depth, they're just tools. If you use on-screen takeoff, or you use 
whatever tools that you're using, whatever software, those are just tools in your electronic toolbox. It's no different than when you were in the field and you used a hammer, nails, <coughs> it's all the same thing. <coughs> um, what, else, what else might be something that really attributes to actually getting the estimates and proposals together other than what I mentioned? Because I don't know off the top of my head. I just want to know if there's something very relevant that I'm missing. Shy bunch. Okay. All right. <clears throat> so work experience. So um, work experience can have a, a lot to do with how good of an estimator you are. Um, your work experience can be, I've got some of the best estimators I've ever worked with actually came into the industry much later in their life. And their work experience that they had before helped them tremendously. Um, I've worked with guys that actually did uh, they had several that were service adjusters for automobile industry. I hate those guys. But they're some of the best estimators because they, they're very, very thorough. Very, very thorough. And so when they learned how to do estimating, um, they took that knowledge with them and attributed it to them. So um, why do you think that matters? That's exactly what I said. So whatever they were doing, however, whatever their skills that they adopted in what they were doing previously could very well help in what you're doing now as far as an estimator. For example, and I just said, if you're an auto adjuster, you have to estimate the cost of damage and repairs. Insurance adjusters, there's a lot of those um, that come over into the construction field. Right now, as you all know, there is a need for estimators, big time, all right? So there's an influx right now of people that are coming into the industry and are trying to learn and trying to adapt from whatever job that they came from before. <coughs> insurance adjusters, and so on. So um, work experience is something extremely helpful, especially if you came from the field, you know, it, it helps you understand. I know for me, I did a lot of drywall, I did a lot of stucco, I did things like that. So when I'm looking at plants, it, it helps me understand the scope a little bit more. It doesn't mean I'm any better. In fact, I've met estimators that have never touched a broom or a tool that just blow me away how, how good they are. It's, it's some of them just have that god given talent. <laughs> Education. I live in College Station. Um, I am not an Aggie. I didn't know what an Aggie was until I moved there. Um, now I've adopted to the culture. But anyways, um, they're very, very uh, highly recognized um, architectural and uh, technology school. They have a lot, they, they've helped with a lot of this technology as well. So some of the universities or colleges that you may have went to helped you. Maybe you took construction science, whatever the case is. That's definitely going to help. Trade schools. There's actually a big rise in trade schools, and I would not be surprised. And you can Google online, there's a lot of estimating schools online, and I think that's actually going to start growing much more because there's such a demand <coughs> for it. <coughs> and apprenticeships. Anybody go through any type of apprenticeship? Maybe an intern? Awesome. Awesome. We had some awesome interns come through our office in uh, College Station. And they were some of the best companies out there. And again, field experience. <coughs> so uh, maybe you were in the construction field, but not necessarily a trade. I've met guys that became estimators, really good estimators, that were building inspectors. Building inspectors reach this certain capita, and they can't make any more. And they start doing estimating, and they do very, very well. Because they're in-depth, they have to understand plans. It's, it's actually good. <laughs> so one thing that I wanted to, uh, again, reemphasize to you, never, never, I mean, even if you're not agreeing with anything, you don't like me right now, that's fine, whatever the case is, never, never stop listening to anybody, because you can learn something every single day, okay? I love this cartoon, we've all seen it in different ways, there's guys on horses with bows and arrows, and a guy comes with a machine gun, it's the same kind of thing. I've seen, and I've met some old, grumpy estimators, <coughs> and some young, real, arrogant estimators don't tell me how to do anything else. <clears throat> I'm, and, and the other thing is, I'm too busy right now. I can't even think about what you're trying to offer. And I used to be like that. I used to have guys, man, for years trying to hit me with OST and all of a sudden plan rooms and blah, blah, blah. I'm like, I'm too busy. I'm over here on the copy machine building out sets across the floor. I don't know if any of you ever have to do that. But um, I would listen. And here's the guy with seven wheels. How, how much improvement is that going to be on their work? 
So always have that open mind and consider, at least consider what somebody's showing you or what somebody's doing differently. Does that make sense? So we talked about field experience. Let's go a little bit more into that. If you were in an actual trade with a sub or a supplier or an inspector, as I said, that's definitely going to help you. If you had a supervisory position in construction as a superintendent, really cool thing about that, that forces you to look at the plans even more. And if you've been a superintendent and come into the office as a project engineer or an estimator, that's going to help you as well. You've had to deal with a lot of uh, discrepancies both of which we mentioned previously. Um, so that kind of helps you as well. And I will talk and talk and talk. So um, I've set like three timers, <laughs> but if they don't go off, you know, somebody let me know if you will, if you don't mind when it's getting close. So. <coughs> project engineers. Any project engineers in, in the room? Okay. That was a mind-blowing experience for me because I had come up through the field, a superintendent and I thought, oh, this is a piece of cake. I actually thought, even, even at that point in my career, that every proposal that came into the office, every submittal that came into the office from the subs, every price change, every change order, whatever it was, I, I took it as this is what it was. <laughs> well, why wouldn't they give me the right thing? You know, why wouldn't they give me what I want? Because their conception of the drawing and the specs may be different from mine. That's why it's so important to really get into all the construction documents. Understand? <laughs> some other supervisory positions and managerial. Um, some field experience which may be non-construction related. Um, I met a lot of guys that, that were estimators throughout these events. Uh, they came from building suppliers. And they actually, they do their own sort of takeoffs. It's a little bit different, but it was a natural fit. So. <laughs> Tools, materials, all right. So, hunches. Yeah, I mentioned that before. So, why is it, you know, a lot of the estimating is based off of hunches. And another thing that goes with hunches that I didn't really, um, I didn't really mention is relationships. Sometimes your relationship with, a, with a, another supplier, another sub, or your GC, another sub, whatever the case is, can make a huge difference in the way that you're estimating your scope of work. It's, it's very, very, and it's something that the industry is losing, and it's something that's, that uh, I hope comes back. Um, when I started with SmartBid, and you guys, as subcontractors, you're going to nod your head from this. Back in the day, I would have to physically print out plans for a painter. I have the paper cut stars to prove it. We didn't have budgets to send out full sets of plans to every single sub, all right? So we would put together sets that we thought, this is all the plans that they need. And we would do that for every single trade, for maybe three to six subcontractors, even on public jobs. This, this was a lot before the diversity uh, requirements and whatnot. The point is, then came the dig digital age. In fact, I was in San Jose working uh, with, um, uh, gosh darn it, the first online planner. I can't remember the name of it. Uh, it escapes me. Anyways. I thought, this is brilliant, this is awesome. I'm gonna start sending out plans via email. Well, at that time, only about 1% of subs had email addresses. So it, it took a long time to get that progressive. What's happened now, and I, I see it daily, um, I work with ConstructionNet now, so we have uh, I square foot and SmartBit together. It's these GCs, and forgive me if there's any in the room, I'm not trying to point you out or anything. They'll select 10,000 subs. Send an invitation bid. And I, 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 for the life of me, I don't understand. I do understand when it's a diversity requirement, and I get that, and I hope that you, the subcontractors here, will take that into account. If you are a minority sub, or whatever the case is, it's very, very important to you to, to respond to those. I know it gets a big pain, especially if the guy's in Alaska, and he's inviting you to a job in Georgia, I think happens all the time. So we've seen this, um, what do you want to call it, um, influx of these invitations to bid, and it's created this, this really bad vibe with subs where they just don't even want to respond. The point I'm getting from all this is we've lost that relationship, right? 
So as an estimator, I ran a, a calculation, I don't have it here with me, where if I sent 3,000 um, invitations to bid on a, on a just typical project, and if every sub, or one, what was 1% one of the subs came back to me, called me on the phone, and they all had the same question, and they already had a prepared answer for them, and then 1% of those, another 1% of the subs sent me an email with the same question, and I had the same response. The point that I'm getting is, it took 52 hours of my time as an estimator. How the heck, as an estimator, am I even getting into the plans and the specs that I'm responding to just noise? Right? So, what's changed is back in the day, and, and some of this still happens with you. You have relationships with your GC or whatever, some contractors. You get on the phone and you go over that project. You go over the scope to get the best possible price that you both can and both agree upon. That's super important. If you don't get anything else from today, I hope you really think about that. So, acknowledging that it is a system isn't used right now, but that doesn't mean you can't still build that relationship with that general contractor or the supplier or whoever else that you're working with. I hope that makes sense. Um, and then swag. How many knows know what swag is? All right, all right. Um, can I say it in here without offending anybody? I hope so. It's, probably, it's just a silly wild ass guess number. That's all it is. But it really isn't. It most of the time, uh, well, I can say I've just thrown numbers out there, but it's an educated guess. It goes back to your hunches and your experience and your own talents and actually your own personality as well. Sometimes that, that resonates a lot. And sometimes you just have to throw a number in on that line item because you want that job. And, and you know, well, I, I, I know we will be good with this. How do you know? I just know. And that's sometimes what you have to do. <coughs> um, so anything else on hunches that might be relevant? Because I, if there's anything in here that somebody has to offer in this whole room, it would be great. Again, like I said in the beginning, I am not the know-it-all. I'm just the one that got elected. Any one of you could probably come up here and actually do the same thing. But I want to know, is there anything else that you're doing that helps you in the estimating aspect? So the tools, we're going to get into more of that later. <coughs> Plan reading. Uh, and again, I talked about just a little bit about me and how I feel. Those are my own feelings about estimating. Okay? Uh, again, I'm not saying that I'm right or wrong. It's just from my experience. But the first thing we really want to start talking about is plan reading and why it's so important. So my own definition is the written and graphic descriptions of the architectural elements, including sketching, drawings and details. And we talked a little bit about this already. It's not only that. It's the emails that go back and forth, right? How many times have you done something completely you changed your price or your take on a scope of work from a text from the GC or a text from your supplier or something like that? Or it could be an email. It could be a phone call. It's not always just <coughs> the plans and specs. First thing that you always want to do with plans is for those that already understand this, I am not trying to humiliate anybody or downgrade anything. I'm trying to be very elementary at the moment. Somebody that doesn't know what a, what a plan set is. So hopefully that doesn't offend anybody. <coughs> so plans, and uh, a lot of us don't do this, and we still, a lot of us have been doing it for a long time, make this mistake. I rarely look at the title sheet, and I'll send an RFI in. And then, like, Mark, it's, it's right there on the title sheet. That is your guide. That is your Google Map guide to where you need to go on this project as far as the plans go. Um, sometimes the symbols may be a little bit different. We'll talk about that. But this is where you can start. If this, this plan right here on every single project that you get has a lot of very relevant information. And it may seem redundant because you see it repeated throughout. But it's all right here. What are the job site? Who are all the designers, engineers, architects on the project? It's all right there. Sometimes I'll look at the architect. As soon as I see who the architect is, I'm not bidding. Or I'll see who the engineer is. <laughs> I guess I'll be going through those structures a lot more. <laughs> right? So 
So it makes a difference. It really makes a difference. The, um, the, the abbreviations, that's not so much an issue, but it can be. If you're in the middle of the plans and you find an acronym or abbreviation that doesn't make sense, it's like, but that's supposed to be whatever. Go back to the title sheet. This architect may, they have egos too. And remember, <laughs> I just want to throw this in there. This architect was the low bidder. <laughs> yeah. Right? Always keep that in mind. They, that same thing. They're the low bidder on this. <coughs> so they're going to do as little as possible. But if they have all the information about the symbols, all, all the, the, um, the drawings for the project, how, how important is that? Wait a minute. I'm looking on the title sheet, and I've downloaded, it shows it at 25 here, but I've only downloaded 20. Something's wrong, right? That's a very good indication right there. So again, what I'm pointing at is all of this information is on this title sheet. So I, I hope when you go back to work, you can stop on that project you look at, go back to the title sheet, and I'll bet you you'll find something like, oh, look, there's that thing I was looking for, okay? <laughs> so what's funny, here's just a typical floor plan. I can understand this. It's taken me a lot of years. Sometimes I still have to uh, reorient my, orientate myself and understand because the architect's doing something a little bit different. I can understand all this. And we're going to talk a little bit about what, what all these things do and the, the different symbols and whatnot. I can understand this. This, I can't do to save my life. This is a Barbie doll house. Instruction set. <laughs> so, again, I can understand all this. I get it. I can't do, I can't do that. But if I stopped, the reason I put this up here is not just to be funny. If I stopped and did the same thing that I'm telling you guys to do, go back to the title page, put it on what do, go back to the title page, look at all the tools that you need to, to assemble this, start from number one, just start doing the steps, right? It's really kind of the same thing. I'll be messing with the body right now because I feel like, no, it's not the same. I have six kids, so um, I've had to build a few of these and always end up with spare parts. So let's look at some plans live. Um, let me see if I can do this real quick. Supposed to go straight to the architect. 
they get really irritated and it's just not the, the proper protocol. If you find something that's a discrepancy on the plan, like in architect it shows, like I talked about certain fall types, you go to structures that's completely different. And in the um, specs, there may be something even completely different. We've seen it happen. So, generate a request for information. If they don't have an official form, you just put it down all together. Document the crud out of it. Take screenshots, do whatever you have to. Hopefully you don't have to take your plans over to a copy machine, copy like I used to have to do. But send all the relevant information um, to the general contractor. What the general contractor will then do is get that information to the architect. Sorry, I'm trying to close this. It's not like me. And um, get you official information. What it also does is it levels out the playing field, right? Because if you don't ask about it and you just submit it, you just say, I'm, I'm just going to exclude 20 gauge studs. I'm going to use 25 because that's what it said on architecture. That's, I mean, it happens. It happens all the time. Um, and then what happens at the end is what we talked about at the beginning. If, if the GC is not paying attention enough, gives you a contract, all of a sudden you go out there in the field, you've got all your material delivered. And I, and I know I'm using something that you guys probably would never do, but it does happen still. I see it. Um, then, then there's going to be a fight. Wait a minute, why are you using, you know, the inspector comes out and says, well, what are these doing here? So, Anyways, keep in mind to always pay attention to the architecturals, the structurals, the specs. If you're not sure, ask the GC. And I teach general contractors a lot of square and the square foot, and I tell them the same thing. When you find something as you're going through the motions of your takeoff, and you're learning about the project, you're looking at plans and things, don't hesitate to pick up the phone and call the GC. If the GC does it in his discovery and he finds an issue with that project, he should, even if he doesn't RFI it, let you guys know as soon as possible. What, if, if there's a discrepancy and the, and the GC knows that it's going to change, why do you think he would not hesitate to let you know? It's going to be a big waste of time for everybody. If you know that there's a scope that needs to be changed or directed a specific way, why waste your time? Why waste his time? So he's going to try to let you know as soon as possible. <coughs> um, we talked about some of this. This is your map to the plan. Um, talk about that. Location, deviations, symbols. Ah, code notes. I didn't even mention that. This can be huge. So right there on that title sheet that we were looking at, it also gives you all the code references. So the building size, um, if it's two story, three story. Um, it, some of them may actually give you other requirements, fire sprinkler requirements, right there in the end. <coughs> All sorts of information is on that sheet. Okay, again, not trying to be too elementary, but it's super, super important. Does anybody not know what scale is? And it's okay if you don't. The scale is a reference on the drawings that you can reference to to see what it would be in real life. Okay, that's a very easy way to say that. Why is it so important? I've had to pay for not paying attention. Again, sometimes my arrogance would get in the way. Like, I think that uh, I, did, didn't, I didn't do my due diligence. Whether you're doing paper plan takeoffs or any kind of digital plan takeoffs, never take it for granted that those are to scale. Okay, it takes a fraction of a minute if, especially if you're using digital to check the scale on that drawing. We're going to talk about that a little bit. Uh, some common architectural scales, one quarter inch equals a foot, eight inch equals one foot. And, and there's a ton more. I just wanted to make sure that I reference. That means on those plans, the quarter inch, because I'm measuring that, equals a foot. Make sense? Okay. Common civil scales, one inch equals 20 feet, or one inch equals 40 feet. Why the big difference? The size that I'm looking at, whether I'm looking, if I'm looking at a 5,000 square foot building, it will fit on an architectural blueprint. Right? If I try to do a quarter inch scale on a site plan, I'm only going to get a fraction of that. Does that make sense? Okay, that's why there's a big difference. <coughs> Again, 
always check, and we already talked about that. So how do we find the scale? Check the scale reference on the plan. Use a known dimension and check it. If there's no scale references, use a known dimension and check it. Always, always check it. So up here, this is like a, on, a, on an architectural. There's always somewhere on the dimension plan, it may be usually it's on the floor plan, they may have several one with dimensions. Find a known dimension somewhere and verify it. Whether you're doing it manual or not, it takes only a second. And I promise you, it would save you a ton of embarrassment and hopefully not cost you a lot of money if you went forward with it. Why? If I'm using the wrong scale and I measure off this room and I come up with, I don't know, I'm new, and I don't, I don't got a hundred square feet. I don't, I don't know what it is. That's what I measured it. It's hundred square feet. What if it's a thousand? And you turn in your proposal, GC, if they're not cool, I guess is the right way to say it. They go ahead and hit take that. May not even question it. And they may send you a contract. So you've got all the carpet in this room for plans and specs, right? Yes, sir, I sure do. Give me that contract. <laughs> yeah, what's going to happen then? It's not, it's not going to be easy. You're going to get a pay for not fire every more square feet of carpet for yourself. Oh Somebody's going to be fired. What's that? That's, oh, like, then the that's how you lose your fire. job. <laughs> that's how you lose your job. <laughs> yeah, you could. Uh, I'm, I'm going to touch so. Years ago, I did a project, and it was all, actually, it was all carpeting at a university. It was just a retrofit. The boss was away. I was the senior, uh, it was my first gig as a senior uh, as we were. It's like, can you take care of this one more? Well, I'm going, yeah, got it. Man, my diversity was all the line. It was like, a, I don't know, a few hundred thousand dollars job. And it was just all carpet, so it was a pretty easy gig for a GC, and a great job for a carpet. We were in a low bid by like $80,000. <laughs> Oops. Well, that's not true. Well, on the plans, on the site, or the uh, index sheet, there was a reference. All the windows in this university had to be recalked. Scaffolding, sky lifts, caulking, lots of labor to tear up the old copy. It was about $800,000 that they wanted, in, or 80000 sorry, $80,000 in addition. Luckily, we had a good rapport with that um, certain uh, university, and they threw out our bid. And I had egg on my face for a long time. I learned a really, really valuable lesson from that. So don't let that be you, okay? Always pay attention to your scale. Always pay attention to the specs. Always look at the index drawing, because it may be on there, okay? So, all right, um, so some of the symbols, again, these are, they seem elementary, but they're not if you've never done it before. And there's going to be a reason I'm going to show you this. They may vary a little bit. There's <coughs> different symbols mean different things on the drawing. So we have what well, we have the, the elevations, which what's the elevation? The elevation is like looking at that wall from the face, right? I know that sounds redundant. A cross section would be what? Looking at that wall, the other wall, right? Okay. <coughs> and then of course from the floor plan, I'm going to get from the top and so on and so on. All of these symbols give you different information on where to go to get more information. If you just look at the floor plan, and again, uh, those that have been in this for a while have done this, we made mistakes. Assuming by not paying attention to the cross section or the details, we've made assumptions, and it's like a big oops when you do that. So I'm going to show you a little bit more about that. We're not going to review the life sheet because that's not working. So here's a cross section, right? And this is the floor plan. It's telling me on this cross section, it's giving me a detail where to go, the detail number, I don't know if you can see that, but there's a detail number, and then there's a plan reference right below it. It's telling me if I look at that, it's going to give me that view as if I was standing at the, the side of that building looking at a crossways, which will give me all sorts of information, the heights that I need to see, and so on. So I'll go ahead and go to that. This is looking at that specific building from that section. Wow, a whole lot more information, right? I know you can't read it, you know, it's okay. <laughs> it gives me a whole lot of information, but even more information. This is now telling me, hey, there's some important information you want to see right here. I don't want to make an assumption that I already know it's there. I don't want to do that. So I'm going to look on this detail, which tells me what? Go to detail F on sheet A501. So as soon as I go there, 
this is that detail. Wow. It's a little bit, I didn't realize that maybe there was a, you know, certain, the wall ties or whatever. I know that's not a very good example. The point is, all this information is very, very clear. And look at all the different trades that are involved in that one detail. Probably every trade you can almost think of. We've got the, the framers, we've got the, the uh, base ring, insulators, um, sheet metal guys, roofers. I mean, everything off that one detail. Super, super important to drill down to the details. Now, if you're using a <coughs> paper set, that would be <coughs> back and forth and back and forth. If that's what you're doing, it's okay. Do it. Do it. Don't make an assumption. Go back to the, the section, go back to the detail, and make sure that you completely understand what's in that floor plan when you're doing that takeoff. If you're fortunate enough and you have a digital viewer, even if it's not takeoffs, if you just have a way to view those plans, split them out. I've done the same thing. That's the floor plan, that's the section, and that's the detail. If you're not doing it digitally, now's a good time to start thinking about that. Because you can see everything at once. It saves time. Not only does it just save time, and not only is it cool to have three or four I five monitors, like the right. I mean, a lot of us do now. It's, it's a necessary tool. If your boss says you don't need two monitors, it's a tool. And it will increase, I can send you articles, it will increase your production. Okay? Not only that, it gives you clarity on exactly what's going on. If I'm looking at something on this, this intersection here, that, that specific area in my takeout that relates to my tray, <coughs> I can see everything in front of me. It gives me clarity. What I mean, like for example, if I'm looking at the floor plan here, on a set of plans, or just on a single string, the phone rings. So, um, ask me a question, or a supplier has a question, or my wife's calling me, what I want to come home, whatever the case is. I forget where I was. With this in front of me, I know, oh, yeah, I was on that detail. That's why I had all this. Over. So, I know this seems kind of silly, kind of elementary, but it really isn't. That if you're not doing this now, I would suggest that you try. Take advantage of it. Take advantage of the technology. Um, based on that, any questions? in regards to plans or symbols, because I know I'm going very high level. This, I mean, we could do an eight hour course on just plans and going through all the spe specifics. It's taken me 30 years more, and I still will not say I know it all. I, I keep an open mind, and I'm willing to learn every single day. But any questions so far? Yes? When you digitally estimate, do you use paper prints too? What's that? When you use those digital uh, uh, digital estimate, do you also use paper plans? I'm so happy because we build that. off of paper plans. I'm, I'm, it's exactly. hard. To... I'm so happy you asked that. So I taught a class at AM and they had never even hardly seen a dirty set of uh, drawings. They only see the ones the professors bring in and they're all nice and clean, and then they do their digital stuff. They just have them for a reference. So I brought in a set from a job site: coffee stains. Torn sheets, red ink everywhere. I mean, sheets torn, missing, or whatever the case is. And they're like, "Wow, well, you know, they should be using an iPad." Yeah. Well, different yeah, range. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah, dirty yeah. fingers. Hey, I'm not saying. Yeah, yeah, there are there are instances, and in, in, I use one um, now as well. Um, but it took me a while to get to that that state. Um, and does your company have the the technology? aspect right now to be able to do that, to have a plan table at the job site trailer that's all digital, whatever the case is. But when I started doing outsource estimating, I had a big plan table. I had an old 17-inch compact Serio uh, uh, tube monitor, and that was my only monitor I wanted to take up. So I would take, I started using my plans as my reference, and then just doing my takeoff on the, on the screen. Then I thought, oh, I don't really need to pay for all these large plants, and so I started just like downsizing my plants just for reference. I got down to where I was just doing eight and a half by eight things for just so I had a, a set to reference to. And then I thought, well, wait a minute, I've spent I don't know in the last month three or four hundred dollars on, on on plants and prints. I'll just buy another monitor, and that was an eye opener for me. So I don't use paper anymore unless I absolutely have to. But I'll tell you, there's nothing like a fresh set of plans to open up on my desk. It's still 
It's still nice. I like it for reference. How do you know you got everything? If I, if Are I you the taking the invitation? Do you know that you have every page and every addendum when you're looking at that? There's a lot of times when you're looking at prints, you can see how the another print might come out and it changes so it'll open your eyes. Oh, I'm, I'm, I'm how glad you asked. We're actually going to talk a little bit more about that. But, um, so I'm not, trying to, I'm not going to try to pitch all of our products mm -hmm. to you guys, but there's, there's products that, that I've used for years that have that overlay feature. Uh, what he's talking about is when you get changes in a drawing, you've got your, your set, um, and then you get a, new, a delta set. Delta is supposed to have all the changes clouded, right? It's supposed to. Doesn't happen. Okay, it does not always happen. So back in the day, um, and every estimator was a little bit different, I would lay in my sheets, I would fold over the title block for the old sheet, put my new one on top, and I, it was basically just looking back and forth to find the differences. <coughs> I'm glad you brought that up. So with a paper set, Unless it's clouded, it'll draw my attention and I know I need to change my estimate, whatever the case is. If it's not clouded, I'm still going to be held responsible if I didn't change my proposal. But with digital, there's a few programs like uh, Construct Connect Takeoff, I know OST, uh, PlanSwift, which just happened with three of our products, sorry. Um, they automatically will do that. So it overlays the drawings right on top of each other and it will show everything in red. That's, that's changed. Anything that's different. And in this market today, there's tons of the data that you guys are dealing with. And they're paid in the debt. You guys aren't. And the general contractors are hiding them from us. They're just putting on the reporting. They're not notifying they're there. We're supposed to go to their program and find that they have it. And all the generals use different reporting. So one might use one type, one might use another type, one might use another type. Do you mean the, so, the, the program? Like they'll just, yeah, like just for instance, they'll put it up on Procore. They will not notify us that they put another page out. They'll just put it on Procore. Well, then another general does something and does that. So trying to find that information is a... Uh, so what, what he's saying, if you can't hear, he's talking about how the generals will just put the information up but not notify you? Yes, you don't know it's coming. Yeah, you don't even know that there is a change. Uh, man, there is not really a great way to... I mean, if they're not notifying you, and some some bid management platforms that they use will automatically notify you, but most don't now, and it's on purpose because it becomes noise. Where if there's an addendum out and it has nothing to do with your trade at all, it's it's nothing. Maybe it's I don't want to go into specifics, but it just has nothing to do with your trade. They may not even notify you, but then at the end of the day, when they say, "Well, you you addressed addendum two, like I never got it." And even if it didn't have anything to do with you, they're still holding you liable just in case it did. Um, the only thing I can tell you, if you're looking at a project and you are interested in it, you are going to take off, is you just better check the plans to see if they've uploaded more plans daily. There are some platforms like um, Construct Connect that automatically, as soon as the GC uploads them, it, if you have the takeoff and you're working on it, it automatically pushes them in there and it notifies you. Up mobile, that there's a change. So, but there's that. That again is another technology that's growing. Is how to, how do I get notified if I'm not sitting at my desk 24 seven, and if the GC's not even telling me? Which shame on them. But we can't stop what they're doing. That is a market trend. Really? Absolutely. Huh? Uh, like I said, the only thing that I can recommend is that somebody has to look at those plans. If you're actually working on that project. Look at the plans daily. That's, that's the only thing I can think of. There's nothing automated that I can think of across the board that's going to take care of that. And that's very unfortunate. It's very, very unfortunate. So. But keeping that in mind, if you do find that there are other drawings, there are several different programs out there, um, digital takeoff tools, not just ours, but there's others out there that will show you those changes in red automatically. Still means you have to go through them. And what's, you know, uh, in fact, Part of the discussion we're going to have, just skip through the slides when we get there, is I'm actually doing a class uh, on just this portion of it where sometimes the GCs, they st every GC does their own takeoff. They actually do a takeoff. It will not be as in-depth as you guys. It will not be as in-depth as the subcontractors um, for various reasons. They just needed to qualify. I call it quantify to qualify. Um, they want to qualify your proposals when they come in so they get an idea of exactly, you know, is this proposal close, is it right, whatever the case is. While they're doing their takeoffs, a good GC, a good 
good GC estimator, we'll find those, those differences, those nuances, and they'll notify you guys beforehand. What a lot of GCs do now, and it's probably the same one sending out 5,000 applications to bid, is they're waiting for you to find the problems. And then, then they'll gather that information because the estimator's not looking at the plans, specs, and drawings like they used to. They're too busy um, taking care of 5,000 invites at one time. I just cannot fathom that. But that's a really good uh, point. It's, it's definitely a big problem. And unfortunately, that's an industry issue that can't be solved by just one program. So it takes your own time or uh, resources to be able to verify that information. Before I would ever turn a proposal in, anyways, is always go back and just double check. Um, in fact, most digital plan rooms, I mean almost all of them, you can, even if you have to copy and paste, copy and paste the uh, manifest, make your own manifest, if you will, and say uh, my proposal is based on just these drawings. If there's a den that I don't know about, or whatever the case is, you, you can kind of cover it yourself. Every program, most programs now are giving you the opportunity to export that drawing. If you don't have a digital takeoff solution, you have just the, the, the index sheet, take a copy of that. Make sure that those are actually the drawings that you have and utilize that or type it out whatever you want to. They're based on these drawings and these specs right here. Hopefully that covers um, Great question. Any other questions? Yes, sir. Someone talk about plan dates. Plan dates. Plan dates, yes. Um, so you'll probably get, uh, if it's a public job, everybody pretty much knows when that, that uh, is due, right? And it's down to the wire. And that's a whole different game than, than private work or even you know, some tenant improvement projects, um, Walgreens, big box, things like that. We know what the bid dates are. However, in all of those cases, I would say 90% of the cases that I've ever seen, the bid date that you guys get is maybe a week or two before, hopefully, that they have to actually turn it in to, the, to their client. And the reason they do that is so they can deep dive through everything, right, and try to come up with their own numbers based off of everything. They're still sending out 5,000 invites, but at the same time, it's just a little bit of a different process. So the bid date, yes? Um, I think what you might have meant. Oh, uh, date. Uh, I'm sorry. sorry. Doesn't mean doesn't mean that they can make another plan, leave it at the date of the original bid, and still issue it later. Yeah. That's that's a nice one. I'm sitting getting to see. It's fun. Then you're real. Then you're really confused. So you're talking you about the actual. So you put on your proposal. Yes. Plan, plan dates. dates. Yeah. Plans dated and, and that. Um, uh, I, yeah, I should have. Uh, so when I some of the programs I'm thinking of, I know Smart Bid does. I think Icebergfoot does, and then. Uh, if you export that drawing list, it'll give you the plan date, the published date. And that's what you want to go off of. Not the date you got them, right? So if you're, if you're uh, qualifying your proposal saying, uh, this is my proposal based on plans dated XXX, that's not the date that you got it. It's the actual date on the bottom of the sheet, right? It could be, they could all be different. Most of the time they're not, but they're, they're usually little, you'll see in sequences, like one may, there may be several drawings that say 1-1-2019, one, one, and then several drawings that say 2-1, um, or whatever the case is. That's a great point. You want to make sure that you qualify that, in case there is an addendum. I'm using A1 dated or published on 1-1-2019. One, one, and if they look at that and go, oh, well, it doesn't have the addendum, maybe they did make a mistake, and they'll send you the correct drawing to revise your drawing. Does that make sense? Did that answer your question? Okay. Yeah. Okay. <coughs> All right. Uh, well, before we go on, any other questions? Uh, again, like I said, there's we could go a whole weekend on plans and do that whole process. This is just very, very high level. All right. Estimating tools. So manual takeoff tools. still doing manual takeoffs, right? Yep. Okay. I still do occasionally. I still have my scale master. I have one of the actual old ones where it has the SCSI cord on it. SCSI? Never mind. Okay. <coughs> Architectural rulers. I love mine. They're great back scratchers now. Um, I don't use them a whole lot for takeoffs. But what those are, 
If you don't know, and you're ever in a bind and you need to measure something quickly on a blueprint, it actually has different scales on it. Every single one of those sides, there's civil scale, there's architectural scale. So you can flip those around to find the scale if you need to do a measurement on plan. <coughs> scale wheel, I still have one that was handed down from a very old gentleman that, that, that I used to work with. I treasure that thing. Uh, I've never, ever used it, but um, some people still do. Do you know what that is? That actually does, this, it, it has a scale on it, and I just roll it along the planet, and it'll tell me how many feet that specific measurement is. Do you still have one? Or do you use the stone? Use the ruler? I use the ruler. Awesome. Okay. They have wireless scale master now, too. So, anyway, I still have one of these. Sometimes, if you're not sure of something, you can take their dimensions. I actually talked to a sub. A few weeks ago, I uh, was talking to him about one of our products, a digital takeoff product. He doesn't do a takeoff as we're thinking. He does no measurements. He does structural steel. He goes to the structural drawings. He has a, a, a sheet. He puts in all the measurements. Why plan beam, beam so and so is this long. So that, this long. He has an Excel sheet. So he doesn't even do a takeoff in the, in the concept of Look at that. I know a lot of suppliers do that with counts, things like that. I never had met somebody that just took the actual dimensions and used those. So I was pretty surprised. So that's actually another way is to use just, just that. Some of the tools, and I still use them even though I'm doing a digital takeoff because I may have to give my set of plans <coughs> to a PM or to a superintendent if I'm not giving them a digital set, which with the digital now I can mark everything up and give them those as well. But Got all your good your goodies that you, you can use as far as manual. Um, cheat sheets. Anybody have any cheat sheets? Cool. I've got a binder that I got from a, a third generation general contractor, and they sell perform concrete. I have formulas that would just blow your mind. So bell piers and all sorts of good stuff. Stuff that I may never have to really use, but I've got a binder that thick of just about everything I could possibly think of. There are several spots on the internet that you can find a lot of that. Create your own library. You probably have a lot of that stuff. If you're doing manual, then you know that you've got different formulas and kind of work with and so on. But it's, it's great to have that information accessible. <coughs> One of the things that I don't have in here, well, I think, okay, it comes into the digital. Digital takeoff tools give a lot more flexibility than manual, okay? For one, if I'm, I, uh, I got stuck one day when I was doing a, a flooring takeoff, and I didn't have one. I just had my rulers and a couple other things, and uh, I had a bunch of curved areas. I was like, oh crap! I got to go back to high school math and try to figure out all these radiuses and, and all this other stuff, and it was really, really difficult. Well, now all that stuff is very, very accessible on the web. So if you don't have a digital takeoff. That, that helps you with a lot of these calculations. Um, there's a lot of places on the web that will help you with that. It's so easy. In fact, when I was cleaning up some of these slides, I did a Google on, you know, how to fly an area on such and such, and I was just blown away. There's YouTube is actually even better than Google because if you go to YouTube, it actually shows a guy showing you how to do it on almost all this stuff. Don't hesitate to use that as a resource. It can be very, very helpful. <coughs> Um, the other thing, too, on digital takeoff is you use any kind of digital tool, it's more accurate. And if I'm in the middle of something, let's say I'm doing a, a, a wall takeoff, and I've done a couple, and I, I colored, colored a few, and then I was doing another calculation, whatever the case is, uh, phone rings, and I take this call, I gotta run to a meeting, and I come back, and I'm like, oh, where, where did I leave off? If I didn't color that, or whatever the case is, or make a note on the plans, or that information is gone, and I have to redo it. With the digital, I can see exactly where I am. Not only that, if I've got RFIs and questions, I can print the screen right then and there and email it to the, to the GC. <coughs> and it's also faster. I, I was old school as well, and I used to fight this, that it wasn't really faster. It is faster. It's a whole lot faster if you're doing manual takeoffs. How much? How much? It totally depends. Percentage. On the trade. What do you think? 
there's not a if you depend on your trade. Um, I mean, for me, uh, I can do a, um, what would take me, uh, I don't know, a couple days on a drywall takeoff, I'll do four hours. So, and, and that's, that's you know, light coat, ceilings, floors, walls, structural, everything. Um, and four hours may seem a lot to some or not enough to others, but that's about what it is. Two days for me on plans, because I'm going back and forth through this cross sections of detail or whatever. I can do all that digitally. It's more accurate because it's to the point. And again, uh, if you get a set of drawings, and I've had these before, uh, I used to do a lot of uh, retail, national retail uh, outlets and stuff, and sometimes the plans would come not to scale. I mean, so far off scale that I had a hard time even trying to find scale with the tools that I had to make that work. So it was, it was it's a little tough. With digital, it doesn't matter. I can change it to anything that I want to, or set a custom scale in a <clears throat> Again, we talked about it being more collaborative. Um, by, by that, I mean not only can I send information. Holy cow, it's already after 10. Um, not only can I send information to uh, anybody on the fly with an email, I can send my RFIs. I can send it to my boss. I can send it to my supplier. I can send it to multiple people at the same time using a digital tool. <clears throat> same on pretty costs. Uh, just quickly, so large company I work for, uh, it was a national retail contractor. They were spending about $100,000 uh, a year on plans, sitting on plans. And then we cut that $100,000 by going all digital to all the subs. And bids got better. And the subs like So just something about it. A little bit more on software. So what is a takeoff software? There's typical ones. Um, again, I'm not really trying to promote ours, sort of. <laughs> Um, on Center, I use On Center for 20 years since 2000, way before I was ever involved with the actual company. Um, I love it. Uh, Plans with again, it is very cool. Coltsoft, if you're a, a mechanical, plumbing, um, industrial piping, it's a phenomenal program. Um, saves a ton of time. <coughs> and then, of course, the estimating what's, uh, what, where was I? Let's see if we do that. Let's see if we do that. Oh, okay. Programs. Software, yeah. So there's there's takeoff software, right? And that's what we've been talking about is just takeoff. And I just want to buzz just a, a, for a short minute on estimating. Takeoff is not estimating, all right? Takeoff is doing the actual takeoff of portions. I'm going to build costs to all of those in my <coughs> estimate, okay? Totally different. If anybody tells you, no, they're the same thing, they are not. They're completely different, okay? Um, there are software estimating tools out there. Uh, some of us were at Sigma last night. If you saw their program, pretty cool stuff. Pretty cool stuff. Um, they're opening up API integration with different uh, platforms, which I'm super excited about. I think that's phenomenal. Um, QuickBid, I've used QuickBid for years myself. Um, not the easiest to learn, but holy cow. Having a estimating software tool is phenomenal because it also gives you uh, historical data, no matter what, what platform you're using, you need historical data that you can utilize quickly to do what? Swag numbers, verify your hunches, things like that. And Excel. Oh, wait, wait, let me back up. How many use Excel? <laughs> Everybody. Everybody uses Excel. Yes. It's, it's one of those things that I thought would go away, and it's just not going away. So I think maybe Excel will go away when BIM plans. We're not doing 2D anymore. Maybe that'll all happen at the same time. So who knows? All right. Real quick. Uh, so there's a lot of choices out there. Find the one that fits. This is super important. I press this on everybody. I'm not telling you to go out and buy anything, but I am telling you to seriously take a look at what you do and find something that helps enhance the current process that you're doing. It doesn't have to replace, I'm not trying to throw a big curveball from learning all different programs. <coughs> Find one that will adapt to the process that you're currently using. Don't let oh, well, yeah, you can use our program, and it's phenomenal, and you're going to be able to do this and this and this, but you've got to learn a whole different way. Then don't do it. That's just my recommendation. Find one that will enhance the process that you're doing now. <coughs> so, for example, this is its, um, you know, on center. You can see this is an actual plant uh, takeoff that I did, shows all the different landscaping and all this stuff. I still have, I have every project that I've done since I uh, had a house fire, so I lost a lot. 
But since 2007, I have every single takeoff that I've ever done. I don't really care about why. I'm a guy, I just don't think about stuff like that. But it has helped me tremendously. If I have something I'm not sure about, I can go back and find all that information. <coughs> um, not just for takeoffs, but also when you're, uh, if you're going to uh, invitation bid, and you, how do you even know that you're going to look at it again? How do you even know? And I've heard so many different stories on how you guys qualify that you're going to even bid on that project. Uh, there, there's no tried and true method. Every single company has their own agenda that they follow to decide we're going to bid that project. So before you go pay for a set of plans, you want to do the drawings. Most invitation to bid platforms that you guys are getting invites from or the, the GC sending you Dropbox or something, hopefully most of you are getting a look at the drawings before you decide to actually bid on our project. Unless your boss just said go ahead and bid that because it's our client and we work for them all the time. <coughs> the point is you can use all various, there's free programs out there. All the ones that I mentioned actually have free viewers. You can utilize those just to view the drawings as well. Okay. <coughs> Reading the specs, um, there's various file types. Obviously, PDF is, is the, the most prominent, and uh, that can be super helpful depending on what type of PDF you get. You can word search, which can be extremely helpful. There are some platforms out there as well in the digital sense where you can word search actually in the drawings, which is kind of cool. Again, don't trust those 100%. Do your homework, go to your scope, read the specs. Look at the plans. Don't just I won't tell your boss, I did a word search and there's no fire alarms on this project. You know, <laughs> you know, don't do that. <coughs> what is the spec? Because I don't know if I even actually mentioned that. Specifications. Specifications. Those are the specifications for the entire scope of that project. Not only your trades, but the whole scope of the entire project from the general contractor side. <coughs> Okay, um, area takeoffs, 
and I, that I want you to put here. Uh, carpet, concrete, paint, those are very typical area takeoffs. I need to know the square footage. Just think of square footage when you're doing an area. That's the basic. <coughs> so, what's really cool, off of a square foot takeoff, I can get several different things. I can do it manually, or with a program, I can get several different of these at the same time. I can get just the overall square footage, like for paint. I can get the square yards, like for stucco, plaster, square yards, or I can get the cubic yards from the square footage if I know the depth. These programs will all do that for you, so you don't have to do it manually, it's more accurate. Um, and then count takeoffs. So I've got, you know, here's a HVAC, this is on books up. I need to see how many registers, whatever. A count is just a singular item. But, you know, ballers, restroom accessories, and so and so. Oops. Oh, I lost the part here. But from counts, like say for concrete, off of count, I can get so many different things. Let's say it's a pier. I know how much concrete's in it. I can tell what the radius is on it. If I need um, how much rebar is going to be in it, I can do all of that off of one count. Just one count. Does that make sense? So there's a lot you can do off of the, off of the uh, basic takeoffs. <coughs> uh, Excel. Everybody, I have seen, I have so many Excel sheets at home. And again, this is one of those estimator things that my Excel rocks. Mine is the bomb. And uh, everybody has one. Everybody's got that historic information, and that's great. It, it, it's a, it is an awesome tool. It's a powerful tool. Um, it is probably still the most widely used tool, unfortunately. But, um, you can actually, the point I want to make because we're out of time, is that you, you can build your Excel to do a lot of this for you. So if I put a linear footage, 10 foot, I can say, in all these columns, I need to know the height that gives me the square footage. Maybe it gives me the uh, square footage on both sides, and then the columns on one side. I need to know the base. I need to know the, just the track and, and the, uh, the bottom, whatever. <coughs> you can also use other ones. You can import um, your takeoffs into your estimating process. Uh, Sigma, last night, I didn't know that about you guys. You can actually import your Excel sheets into that to get that historical data, which is pretty cool. Did I say that right? Yeah, that's correct. Okay. You can also live things directly into Sigma. Right. You don't have to go across the And, and that's, a, that's a stumbling block when somebody goes and tries to take their Excel yeah. into another program and it's like, yeah, I kind of like history. So I think that, that's really cool. So there are other things out there. That's a different uh, estimate of the quotes off and so on. And don't forget to check out the big coach videos when we have to. You can always make nasty comments on it if you want to. But that's all I have.